Good morning, college football fans, and welcome to Three and Out College Edition right here on IE Sports Radio. Your directly for all that is sports. Well, here we are, y'all. Full season rolls on, and we are now just literally one day away from the college football playoff. We got the New Year's Six coming up. I don't even know if they call it that anymore, but we got all these bigger bowl games coming up. And oh yeah, a college football playoff game that will determine who's going to that national championship on January 10th. This is going to be quite the show, as we have had so many odd little things happening within bowl season this year. You know what I'm talking about, because, well, <laughs> we have some things to discuss about this COVID protocol, and we also got to get you in on our latest picks and the recap since we've last been on a few days ago. Once again, you are tuned in live to Three and Out Call Edition right here on IE Sports Radio. You're going to be for all that is sports. Welcome, 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 college football fans. Well, I'll tell you what, this has been quite the bowl season, and usually we say that in the best way, because, well, it's college football, and we love college football, and it's fun talking about college football, and we love our predictions, and even if we're not right, (laughs) and of course, we definitely enjoy talking about these possible future, uh, well, soon-to-be future stars. I just said something two times, future and sooner. <laughs> oh, speaking of the Sooners, man, what a game last night. But I got to tell you, we do got to address something. Uh, and it is this stuff going on with COVID. Because sometimes it seems a little bit ridiculous. And the things I was reading on Twitter the other day from the actual fans, angry fans, ah, man, it's... it's uh, Something's got to give. So, with that said, y'all, welcome, welcome, welcome once again to 3 and Out College Edition. Right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Here to help me talk about all these, cra- these crazy things going on here in this bowl season. Uh, of course, he is my co-host here on 3 and Out College Edition. He is also one of the COOs of IE Sports Radio. Ice Sports Radio Hall of Famer, Class 2020. He is the founder and host of both Set Point and the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it is an honor to, uh, to introduce you to my co-host, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terry Rodriguez. What's going on, Terry? How you doing today, brother? Hey, Larry. I am doing fine today. Ready to talk some college football. Another great day. And... Bold Mania is in full weight. Oh, yes, it is, man. Glad to have you here as well, brother. This is, uh, man, Darren, we, you know, it's crazy. We we have had, oh, man, it's like our fifth show, I think. Or We've had a lot of shows during bowl season, of course, and we're not done yet. I mean, we got bowl season here. We we got some, op- some off-season shows, of course. Talking about the Shrine, the East West Shrine Bowl. We got that. We got the Senior Bowl, of course. And we got a lot of shows coming up too uh, later in January. But here we are, man, two days away from the new year. And man, we have seen some things happen. So here we are. The last time we were live, Taryn, was on Tuesday morning. Since then, we've had a very uneventful. <laughs> A thriller of a first responding bowl. A Liberty Bowl that was very shocking to say the least, but what a game and what a job by one of these teams that we didn't pick. Uh, and of course, a, I wouldn't say uh, horrible 
guaranteed rate. Both of that was a really good game, but it looked it was definitely more one sided than the score. I'll tell you. And a Holiday Bowl that never was, and boy, that sparked animosity like crazy across Twitter, especially if you were just looking in at all of the darn tweets. That was, wow. Um, you know, I'm sure you were, I don't know if you were taking a look at those, or just, you know, I mean, uh, not paying attention too much to it to, to see what people were saying, but dude, it was crazy. Um, and then, of course, yesterday... Uh man, the pinstripe bowl was uh well we're gonna get we're gonna get into all these things here, but a couple of one sided games uh in bowl season and well this was one of them. But I'll tell you what, the Cheese Bowl and the Alamo Bowl were actually pretty solid. Alamo Bowl was kind of what we thought it would be. Uh but man, I you got some you got some issues, Oregon. And of course, Good old Clemson winning that cheese bowl. Coach Davos when you get in the cheese to bath, if you will. But of course, all those little snippets, and then of course, plenty of games of the day. Uh, not to mention we have the canceled Fenway Bowl. And yeah, it kind of gets the bummer on all ends for everybody involved in that. But then of course, like I said, we got plenty of good games coming up today. And man, we got a nice little slate of games coming up. On this beautiful Thursday, uh, we got four of them. Hopefully, none of these. Hopefully, none of these get canceled within the, within five hours of kickoff, Darren. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now we got those, and then of course tomorrow's New Year's game. So or New Year's Eve game. So with that said, Darren, let's get right into the action, man. So first things first. Let's get into Tuesday's games since we last left off. We just got off air right at kickoff of the Birmingham Bowl. Uh, and, well, Taryn, that was actually a pretty good football game, man. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know, I, my, my gosh, I, I, hopefully you didn't say a few minutes ago that was a blowout, because it wasn't, um, but that was referring to another game, probably, my apologies, I'm everywhere right now. It's 7 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> just got up a little bit ago, so my apologies, you guys, but, um, yeah, 7 a.m. Pacific time here, but Taryn, number 20, Houston, they freaking did it. Now, we knew Auburn was going to give them a fight. We knew this SEC school was not going to go down without a fight. And, man, Cougars and Tigers, I mean, that that seems like a battle, you know. So, these two teams got underway. 7-0 at the end of the first quarter. Houston led it. And then they go up 10-0. Now, Auburn would get a field goal in the second quarter, and it was 10-3. Still a pretty solid game, nothing crazy, uh, definitely not a horrible football game. We got ourselves a good one, but it just kind of seemed like Houston just had the upper hand. I don't know if you felt that way, Taryn, but in the third quarter, though, Auburn would come out and prove like, hey, guess what? We're here. Uh, you need to get that nonsense out of your head. As they would score 10 unanswered. Uh, it will 13 unanswered if you count, of course, the second quarter. And then, of course, in that fourth quarter, though, we have Clayton Tune to Jake. Oh, yeah. To, sorry. To Jake Herslow for our 26 yards into the end zone. Dalton with this one with the extra point. With 3.27 to go, man, 17 to 13 with, uh, you know, just over three minutes. And, wow, that would be the final score. The Cougs, man, would win this thing, 17 to 13, and finish your season at 12 and 2. How about that game, Darren? Yeah, so that was a big win for Houston. I'm not really surprised just because Houston was ranked and they only lost two games all season. I have to give credit to Auburn. They played as hard as they could, and they did start Bo Nix. They started T.J. Finley, who was only a sophomore. So, honestly, I it was, this game was kind of expected as Houston took care of business. I was a little surprised they kind of got lulled in the second quarter all the way to the fourth quarter, but they did come up big in that fourth quarter as – Houston, despite throwing two interceptions, was able to overcome that and overcome six penalties, even though it was only for 34 yards, to basically get the win over Auburn. Their offense was efficient as they had nearly 400 overall yards in terms of offense. As once again, they 
they mainly passed the ball, and it wasn't bad by all means, but they could have played a little bit more cleaner of the game. But you can't complain about this win. Not at all, Darren. It was it was a good one, man. I really enjoyed this game. Um, it was a, a great one to start off this day, especially as crazy as it would get a little bit later. But overall, great stuff. Sanctuary Mark, we got Dell here with a ten, ten carries, sorry, ten receptions for 151 yards, and Tune had a pretty okay day. Uh, Twenty six for 40, 283 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Um, Caskill. Almost there. He had 14 carries for 78 yards, but overall, man, it was enough. Got a good victory there, and there you have it. Congratulations to number 20 Houston for winning this year's Ticket Smarter Birmingham uh, Birmingham Bowl. So, next up, Darren, we had a freaking dogfight, man. I mean, this this was a good one. This was probably one of my favorite games of bowl season so far, man. This thing went back and forth. Uh, there were points, but there was also some good defense in here as well. So, Next up, we have the Servo First Responder Bowl, and uh, yeah, man, this was this was great. We had here Air Force taking on Louisville. Louisville actually, I um, forgot their favorite or what or not, but Louisville not necessarily the highest record coming in at six and six. Air Force was nine and three, so you know they had a three game. They were up three games, basically, you know, uh, and, and <laughs> Air Force, man, <laughs> I, I, if they were a favorite, I'm pretty sure they felt a little disrespected, but regardless, they came into this thing ready to roll. Uh, 7-0 at the end of the first quarter, they were actually up 14-0 here at the start of the second quarter. Louisville responded, Air Force responded, and then Louisville responded, and then Air Force responded. I mean, Darren, this thing went back and forth in the second quarter, very eventful second quarter, but... We would have at the end of the second quarter here a score of twenty-eight to fourteen. Yeah, talk about an explosion in the second quarter. Well, that's about the most explosive we're going to get within tons of touchdowns scored. But I love it because if you like offense, you got all the offense you wanted in the second quarter. If you like defense, you got pretty much everything you could want in the third quarter, man. Because there was a brawl of defense, man. I really enjoyed this. We we uh, didn't get a touchdown until four seconds left here in the fourth quarter from Louisville. Uh, sorry, in the third quarter. And it was 28-21 heading into the fourth. Air Force led it. Uh, and crazy, man. This one field goal just said so much. Matthew DePore with a 26-yarder with 5.28 to go. Uh, yeah, 5.28 to go in the game. Going up by 10 points. Louisville knew the task at hand, a little tough, but did it. Oh, I mean, they didn't complete it, but, I mean, still got in the end zone. Uh, it would be a Malik Cunningham, 22-yard carry into the end zone. Brock Travelstead with the extra point, 31-28 with 2.57 to go. Uh, I did not see this. I'm sure they attempted the onside or, you know, wh whichever happened, didn't, though, for Louisville, and did happen for the Air Force. And look at this, man. The Air Force Academy Falcons showing that they are still a dominant program because they were pretty dang dominant about 10 years ago. They were a solid football team. And, and they've actually been throughout the decade. You know, they've been pretty all right. And, well, they're showing here. We can still win 10-game seasons and look pretty good. So check out the Air Force, man, getting it done. 31-28 over Louisville to win this year's Servo. First responder bowl. How about that game, Terry? Yeah, it was an incredible game from Air Force, and they pretty much controlled the momentum in that first half. Like, they they pretty much controlled the game altogether. They never trailed. And honestly, despite them only putting up three points in that second half, they pretty much prevented Louisville from doing too much damage, as Louisville didn't even score in that second half until the end of, toward the end of the third quarter. And Honestly, I think Air Force just played a complete game. We we were, I think we both picked Louisville, and we were both mm -hmm. kind of wrong on this one. So I think this was also a rare t occasion where Air Force really passed the ball well, and they passed the ball more often than not. So all in all, Air Force did change its strategy, and it paid off, and I think that's what caught Louisville off guard. I'm right there with you, Darren. 
Daniels actually had a very good day, man. I mean, you're right. He didn't throw very much at all. But 9 for 10, man. Daniels went 9 for 10. 202 yards, which is amazing. That's pretty darn good for so, for so many, you know, less passes. And two touchdowns. Roberts, 20 for 77 on the ground, helping his team out there. And Lewis, man, five receptions for 172 yards and two touchdowns. Pretty solid day for the Falcons. And there you have it. So, all right, Aaron. This was about the time we got some crazy news. And... Okay, <laughs> the deal goes like this, because uh, it was right around the start of this game. We have the AutoZone Liberty Bowl between Texas Tech and Mississippi State, and how I want to approach this is kind of how it felt in real time. This game was getting underway. It was a good one. It was a very good football game, uh, from one side, that is. <laughs> the team that we thought wasn't going to you know, show up and play as well as they did showed up and played amazing. And the team that we thought was going to actually win this game looked like they weren't there. So, the start of this thing, Texas Tech taking on Mississippi State in the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. Darren, Texas Tech, man, got off to an amazing start. 10-0 at the end of the first quarter. Second quarter here, 13-7, of course. The Bulldogs would answer back. Into the third quarter, and that was it, man. That's the only time the Bulldogs would ever do anything in this game. They would answer back, but that's about it. Um, their defense, you know, did some did some things, but not a lot of things, as the Red Raiders couldn't really be stopped. And well, the Red Raiders would dominate and, in the second half and just go completely. The, three more touchdowns unanswered. Of course, if you add the field goal at the end of the second half, at the end of the second quarter. Um, that's a lot, man. <laughs> you know, 24 unanswered points. And, yeah, 34-7 final score here. And not to, like, interrupt this game because I want to get back to the stats and all this, this, and that. But right around here is where we would hear that UCLA would actually pull out of the Holiday Bowl. So, once again, just keeping it in real time. This is the game where I feel, I think at least, where we started hearing the news, and it was kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah, that's where this happened, at least, in my opinion. Actually, it was I think it was a little bit before this. This was this kickoff was at 3, it's at 3, uh, 45 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so it was a little bit before this, my apologies. But, like I said, we'll keep it, like, how it went in real time, and you heard it all throughout, like, the games, they would give you, like, updates and tell you that UCLA pulled out and all this is snap. But, yeah, so now let's not shed light on that no more until the end of this one. But, Taryn, solid game once again. Texas Tech basically just took Mississippi State around the woodshed, man. The Red Raiders just completely dominated Rodgers. Uh, 32 for 53. 290 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Johnson, nine carries, 62 yards and on the ground. And then Williams, five receptions for 72 yards. Not eye-popping numbers, but they had an eye-popping performance. So what do you think about this game, Darren? Yeah, Texas Tech really dominated this game for the most part. Like They pretty much took control in the second half, but they were in control for the most part in this court, in this game for the most part. And, Honestly, I can't really get mad at it just because Mississippi State made too many mistakes. They had two fumbles, and Rodgers had that interception, and Rodgers' running back and receiver didn't do him any favors with the, with said fumbles, and that's pretty much what hurt Mississippi State going forward. And this is kind of an embarrassing loss for them because, first of all, Mike Leach and his offense should have done a whole lot better because – Will Rogers was this great hot shot quarterback with over 4,000 passing yards. And they lost to a Texas Tech team, which finished second to last ahead of Kansas, of all teams, in the Big 12. So I don't know what happened with Mississippi State, but all in all, they did not look good. Because when you're turning the ball over three times, it's, it's hard to come back from that. And even though Mississippi State didn't even – even though they won the penalty battle, I thought that Texas Tech just played a much more solid game. 512 overall yards, 
they had a balanced attack when it came to rushing and passing. So all in all for Texas Tech, they really surged past the Mississippi State team, and it's just another loss for the SEC. It was, Darren, and crazy, man. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, embarrassing. I, I agree because to, Mississippi State is actually. I mean, this year has been down. I mean, they haven't. Let's just be real, Darren. They haven't been. They haven't been that good since Dak Prescott was there, and kind of a. Uh, kind of funny to bring this up, but I don't know, Darren. I mean, with the way these two teams are playing right now, at least right now, going into week 17 of the NFL, I don't know, brother. This might be – now, don't get me wrong. I don't think this is how the game would end up from either of these sides. But the two teams facing each other here, we have Dak Prescott's Mississippi State Bulldogs and Patrick Mahomes' uh, Texas Tech Red Raiders. I'm not saying anything too crazy here, but, uh, you know, the Cowboys and the Chiefs are both playing pretty solid. I'm just saying uh, that, that I don't know if that's a sign that we might see Chiefs, Cowboys in the Super Bowl this year. I don't know. But I'm just saying, uh, funny that they both met up. But, yeah, extremely one-sided game, though. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm very disappointed as well in Mississippi State's performance. I really thought they would come out and ball and have a good football game. We don't, of course, I think we both picked them. Both thought they would win it. But uh, just, just a rough season for them, though, man. I mean, their last game of the year, they would lose the Egg Bowl. You know, they would not They would have a good game with Ole Miss. Of course, they're rivals, but just a really off, tough year for these guys, man. So, Hale State, tough one, man, but wreck them. That's exactly what that's exactly what Texas Tech did, man. So good game here, and well, best all the best to them next season. So, all right, Taryn. So once again, this game was ridden with UCLA pulling out. This is not. Um, now that I think about it, my apologies. You actually we heard this as early as this Air Force Air Force Louisville game somewhere in the middle of that. And, well, we heard that UCLA would freaking pull out of the uh, of the Holiday Bowl. And it was like an outrage, man. I, I guess, you know, me, I want to check out and see what the real fans got to say. Not everybody on Twitter is a real fan, but a lot of people are true diehards, you know, and they, and they absolutely love their team. And they have some very good things to say. Uh, sometimes... If they say something negative, they're actually correct. Sometimes they're wrong. Um, and then, of course, sometimes, um, and even myself, too, you know. But then, of course, sometimes it's actually pretty accurate, even if it's, you know, something crazy that happened like this. I mean, you know, so let's get into it. Darren, dude, what the crap, man? Um, <laughs> UCLA announced... That I remember, I heard it from you first. Actually, you tagged UCLA the post that said that they weren't going to participate in the Holiday Bowl, and you said something about Uncle COVID, or you know, you said that. Remember, uh, and you tagged the three and out college edition uh, Twitter account, and I was like, get out of here. And it was like just then, man, freaking everything on the news, well, on the news, but. During the bowl games, you heard like, oh, UCLA pulled out and whatever. So I just happened to take a look at that post here. I clicked on the UCLA post and scrolled down. And, dude, like, people were very angry. <laughs> all right. Um, all you saw were posts saying, I mean, SeaWorld was, like, trending, I think. I'm just kidding. But it was pretty crazy. People were like, oh, yeah, so how was SeaWorld? Blah, blah, blah. They were getting all over SeaWorld because apparently UCLA had a SeaWorld trip. And, of course, for those of you who don't know, these bowl games are kind of like, uh, you know, they are like they have festivities and everything before the games. The teams arrive a couple days early, and they do things, and I mean, I don't know if it's every team, but I do know that some of these teams do that, and well, I went to SeaWorld, and I was just curious, so I clicked on UCLA's main account, of course, their football account, and yeah, 
there was a video, a freaking video posted of them at SeaWorld and having a good time being college kids. Nothing wrong with that. Because I even saw one person saying, like, oh, like, you know, they're just being college kids, whatever, whatever. And you look at the comments and people are freaking out. They're over there saying, oh, yeah, you can do this, but you can't play the game. You got chickens and this is snad. You guys backed out. And North, uh, North Carolina would have smacked you guys anyway. And all these just really mean, derogatory, negative things. And you, if you watch a little bit of the video, yeah, I mean, ah, you hate to say it, but some people had a point. They're like, look at these kids over here wearing masks improperly, and no, you know, like all this is and that, and this is really COVID protocol and whatever. And yeah, there were a couple of masks pulled down, but I felt like some of these kids probably just pulled down for the video. Um, you know, I'm going to defend these kids because, gosh damn it, they're, they're college kids, man. Let them be. However, the trip as a whole, I mean, whoever planned that, okay, maybe not the smartest thing because of all this going on, I'm not going to sit here and blame the kids whatsoever. These players, it is not their fault. They're just be enjoying what was brought to them. So if they get a bowl game, they beat UC, uh, USC this year, they had a pretty solid season, they went to SeaWorld, man, let them go to freaking SeaWorld uh, and enjoy themselves if they're allowed to and permitted. Whoever permitted that, though, might have thought twice. Um, am I saying that it came from SeaWorld? No. I'm just saying somehow some of these kids got sick. They could have been sick last week. I have no idea about the details. Maybe you have plenty more, Taryn. All I'm saying is, is everyone was getting on the SeaWorld thing. And then it got even crazier, reading the comments further. I went back to the other comment, uh, the other one, Taryn, the official statement. And, dude, I don't know if you saw any of these. I'm pretty sure you did. But, oh, my God. People... We're freaking out, and you know what, Tarim? They had every right to, because they. I started reading some of these really like messed up tweets, and it wasn't like messed up as in like horrible. It was just like, great, I just made the trip here. My flight landed. You know, I just got here last night, or I just got my hotel room, or uh, you know, like people from North Carolina. And dude, like. I felt really bad for them, like, saying, like, are you going to refund me UCLA or whatever, whatever, and, I mean, like, they literally made the trip across the country, dude, we're talking about 3,000 plus miles, they checked into a hotel, which hotels are not freaking cheap, um, and, and I mean, you know, I don't care what they checked into, even a motel, I'm just saying, man, like, that that's money, you know, that they spent, I'm pretty sure, I, I, don't, I mean, I'm I'm not sure how the game works. I'm almost positive they get refunded from the game. But still, man, like, I'm just saying when it comes down to, like, the travel and all that, and that's cold-blooded, man. That's that's time. I saw in there saying, oh, great, you know, we spend – people spend their time away from families. They're traveling on Christmas, which – I didn't think they'd be traveling that early, but maybe that's a possibility, Taryn. The flights were going out that a little bit earlier. I don't know. But all I do know is that that was messed up, man. UCLA pulled out like five hours before kickoff. People were outraged. Even some UCLA fans were kind of angry because they were like, great, I just started on my way to San Diego or I just got here. I even saw one person tweet, like, I'm in the parking lot. <laughs> like, I'm tailgating. I just started tailgating and I just heard the news. Like, are you serious? Like, people were really, really irritated about this. And Taryn, I have no, I am totally with them. Um, I understand that. So... It's hard because, like I said, I'm not faulting the kids. I'm not fa faulting these players. They just went and had a good time because they were told to have a good time. Um, like I said, the masks in that video and everything, that was probably just for the video. They wanted their face to be seen. whoop de freaking do But whoever planned that trip, okay, that might not have been the smartest thing during COVID times. And then, of course, I get it. They couldn't compete, but there's a lot of players on that team I really don't know how many players were out tearing, but somebody did some, and I'm going to leave it here, and I want you to go all out on this thing, man, of course, because, of course, you, you, you cover, you know, them on the SoCal Spring Sports Show and everything, but I will say this, Taryn, I will say this, somebody in that, it, it, well, I think a couple people said it, in the, uh, in those tweets, that for teams that do this, like this pull out, because we've seen teams just pull out, but for teams that pull out, like, within 48 hours, I think I saw this, somebody suggested that they need to be reimbursed for their travel and everything on top of that. Now, is that 
I mean, of course, you have to prove it and all that. Now, is that radical? I mean, maybe. I don't know. But honestly, dude, I kind of side with them a little bit. Because I'll tell you what, Terry. If we're SC fans and Cecilia and you and your, your brother and, 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 and all of us, man, and some of the cats from I Sports Radio here, we all traveled over to see USC play in the Orange Bowl in Florida. Uh, I don't even know how that would happen, but if they did, I'm just saying, Taryn, it would be kind of irritating if we got there, checked in, you know, we got our, we got our hotel rooms, checked in, and we're, like, getting ready to leave the hotel, and out of nowhere, Taryn, we hear canceled, and we're like, are you serious? We spent all this money? Are you serious? Like, oh, heck no. Like, somebody needs an answer. I'm sure we're going to get reimbursed for the game, but what about all this travel and everything? So, I'm just saying, Taryn, you know, you put us in that situation. So, I'm going to shut up and let you have it. But, Taryn, this is what happened. And, well, here's – that's where it lays. So, take it away. Yeah, it is incredibly disappointing because the NC State fans had to travel 3,000, maybe even more than 3,000 miles to California just to see it get canceled. And I totally agree with you. I think those fans should get reimbursed for their plane tickets or, heaven forbid, if they drove all the way to California, then they need to be reimbursed for that and they need to be reimbursed for their tickets. And it's mostly for their players as well because their players miss Christmas for this. They miss being with their families just to see their game get canceled. And it really sucks because... NC State had a fantastic season. UCLA had a resurgent season. And to see that it got canceled because UCLA just couldn't go is downright unbelievably sad. And there were rumblings that they were going to have a replacement for UCLA. And get this, the replacement team for UCLA was recommended to be San Diego State, a team that already played a bowl game. Now, that makes zero sense. You can't just have a team play a second bowl game. I understand you don't want to waste the money, but San Diego State already played a bowl game, and you can't, and basically it's like home field advantage for them. And again, it's understandable they want to have a replacement, but why can't you get another team like, a team that probably didn't make the bowl game and have them, like, partake in it? Like, Like, for example, Rutgers was able to replace a team that was unable to play in the bowl game. And you can't just get, like, another team, like, recommend recommended to, like, uh, take the place of UCLA, which then has, like, the second highest uh, RPI rate or something like that. So all in all, it is saddening. I understand health, is, health and safety is the number one priority for UCLA, but I just think it's a little disappointing just because NC State had a resurgent year and – they definitely could have – they definitely deserve better than this. So, yeah, and NC State also was at SeaWorld, and apparently they're 100% vaccinated. So, there's that. Well, Saren, I, I, I'm with you, man. I, I feel like they, these players or the people involved, man, need to be reimbursed somehow, some way. But that's not cool. I, I would be freaking mad, like beyond belief, man. Uh, that's a lot of money. Plane flights are not cheap. I mean, I get it. They can be, whatever. But, dude, they're not just, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't just, that's distance, that's time. How can you pay somebody back their time? Yes, it's their decision for going, but my goodness, are you serious? You know, like that's time, man. And you're right. Christmas, away from their families, these players, and it's true, yeah, they went to SeaWorld too, but gosh dang it, are you freaking for real, like, I don't know, man, I, I just, I just don't like how that, so, so what do you think now, and, and San Diego State, wow, I did not know that, that's crazy, see, you're the insider over here, or I mean, not the insider, but yeah, you know, you know more than I do for sure with that, man, you cover these guys, but, or Southern California Sports, um, dude, moving forward, Oh, my goodness. I hope we don't get no more of this. <clears throat> but today we got one, two, three, four games. Or, f- oh, no, what do we got today? We got five. Uh, yeah, we got four games, okay? We're going to get into those in a few moments. 
Tomorrow, we already have a game canceled, man. We, we, we're we not going to get the Arizona Bowl. And I'm really, really irritated about that. Because, why? Okay, here we go again. COVID. And we were going to have a good football game, man. I was excited for that. And now it's gone. So, Rutgers, of course, replacing. You know, I'm going to say, uh, in, in for, for the uh, Taxley or Gator Bowl, like... This is a mess, and just in case, but at least they're, they're there, and hopefully the games get played. Now, question for you is, moving forward, any of this nonsense happens, I mean, of course, COVID's COVID, gotta be serious about everyone's health, but I just gotta say this, Taryn, this happens again, where a team freaking cancels in the last, you know, we're, we're within like five hours, or even like within a day. What do you think needs to happen, man? I mean, do you feel that this team should be forced, of course, to forfeit, and people need to be, like, refunded heavily? Um, I even saw, in, in this is what I forgot to say, too, I just remembered it right now, but I saw somebody else in the chat room, or, or in the comments, say that they should be, and this is a little harsh, um, but not only should the, they should the schools where I guess the, I guess referring to the school, not only should they reimburse the people, um, but their program should get a one year ban from next year's bowl season. I think that's a little crazy, but uh, dude, what, moving forward, man, we've got a few games left here, some very important ones. What do you think should? Where where does it really end? Like what what do you think? If you think anything at all should happen to teams that cancel within the last, like within like hours of kickoff, um, should they already know this? I mean, you know, like I, I, maybe they're waiting for test results. I don't know. But what do you think should happen, man? Just leave it alone and just let it be. And hey, whatever happens, happens. Or no, you guys are cold. You guys are kind of shady. Uh, all this happened. Everyone's here. They traveled far away. Forget you. If we can't refund everybody, then forget you guys. You guys knew what the task at hand. You guys knew what's up. Maybe you can't refund everybody back, but you you get a ban for next year's bowl season. I mean, I don't know, Taryn. People are really, really, really mad about all this. So, what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, we def they definitely should. Everybody should get refunded, and also the entire school should get reimbursed for the airfare tickets mm -hmm. and all the sacrifices that the teams and players and coaches and everyone had to make to get to San Diego because that's not a far, a close trip for NC State fans. It's, once again, it's like 3,000 plus miles from North Carolina all the way down to San Diego. So, yeah, I think you should – I think what the FBS should do is they need to have the next team on hand be on standby mm -hmm. and – even though it would be like maybe last minute or like just inform them within a day saying just be ready for something. Because I did say that San Diego State was recommended to be the next team to like replace UCLA, but their athletic, their athletic director basically just said no. Yeah, when asked, <laughs> would San Diego State football like to play another bowl game? And he just said no. So... All in all, just have the next team, like, handy. Like, the next team with the high, highest RPI and so on and so forth. Like, even if it has to be, like, Cal or UCL or USC or any of that sort. Like, just have the next team on standby just to say, hey, you're going to be playing in this bowl game. We'll give you a day or two to practice and then be ready, be pretty much ready to go and don't have any of your players have COVID and whatnot. So that's basically my recommendation. But I think the FBS should definitely have the next team prepared just to say, hey, just to, just in case you're wondering, your team could be called up. And, and that's cool, dear. I, I know the only issue for me with that would be, like, some of these kids go home because they live, like, New York or somewhere far, and now they go home for the holidays sometimes. Maybe they don't. But, yeah, all i got to say is even if they go with some without some of their best players or without some players, I mean, hey, try to make up the bowl game some way, shape, or form. Uh, however, if it's way out of hand, it gets ridiculous and no one's there and no one can be called up or whatever, then, yeah, I 
I just canceled the dang game. But anyway, man, that was a bummer. I, I did not want to talk about that. I want to talk about the Holiday Bowl instead. I want to talk about how good this game would have been. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't get it. Regardless, we did get one game to end the playoff, or to end the playoff, to end this day of bowl season. And you know what, Aaron? It was, ah, I felt like it was a little more one-sided than what the score looks like, but it was still a pretty good football game, man. So, this was the guaranteed rate bowl. And West Virginia, coming in at 6-6, six and six, will take on the 8-4 and four. Minnesota Gophers, and this was just a, it's a good game. This is just a good football game. I enjoyed it, of course, Taryn. You know me. It was a more defensive game. I ate it up like a bowl of Cheerios, and I definitely enjoyed it. Um, in the second quarter, we got pretty much all the scoring because <laughs> we'd have a – a Minnesota touchdown followed by a Wisconsin uh, – sorry, Wisconsin – followed by a West Virginia touchdown – Followed by a Minnesota touchdown. What does that give you? Oh, and of course, we would have a two-point conversion fail here. Um, kind of funny. We would have one good two-point conversion and, well, uh, one failed two-point conversion. The good one came from Minnesota. The bad one came from Virginia, uh, from West Virginia. Uh, but 15-6 to six at the half. Minnesota would lead it. In the third quarter, we get one field goal from Minnesota, 18-6, to and defense said the rest, man. In the first quarter, tons of defense. In the fourth quarter, tons of defense. And there it was, man, 18-6. to Final score. Minnesota, man, they balled. Morgan, 8 for 13. Didn't throw the ball, ball, the ball a whole bunch, but 109 yards, one interception, looked pretty good. Thomas, 21 carries. 141 yards, one touchdown on the ground. That young man earned a very good game on this one. And then, of course, uh, Wright, two receptions, 58 yards. Uh, as you can see, that's the leading receiver of the game, so not a whole bunch. But they did rely on that ground game plenty. And, hey, Wright did his thing as well. Morgan did his thing. Overall, man, this was a solid football game for Minnesota, and they earned themselves a bowl victory. So what do you think about this one, Terry? Yeah, like you said, this one was more defense orientated, especially in the second half. Minnesota didn't play its best game as they missed a field goal in the first half, they fumbled the ball in the first half. So <laughs> all in all, Minnesota played much better in the second half, and I think they really held West Virginia and kept their offense in check because West Virginia did not have the best offensive day. They only had two hundred six yards altogether, whereas Minnesota just dominated through the ground game and had 249 in terms of rushing yards. All in all, Minnesota just, and I mean, even though Minnesota had two turnovers, a fumble loss and an interception, they made up for that, and like they said, they played a cleaner second half. They shut out West Virginia in the second half, and honestly, I think their Big Ten conference schedule kind of showed I'm not, I'm not saying that West Virginia didn't get battle tested in the Big 12, but I think in the Big 10, it's basically a battle throughout most of the season and conference season. So I really got to give credit to Minnesota for this win, and who knows what can happen next year. I'm right there with you, Darren. So that would cap off Tuesday, the tw December 28th, and on to Wednesday, yesterday. And, Darren, the funny part about this day is we don't really have to spend a whole bunch of time on it. I mean, Maryland came out yesterday in the new era. First things first, the Fenway Bowl, I was excited because the Red Sox and, and Yankees find a way to battle in even other sports like college football. Uh, however, the Wasabi Fenway Bowl was canceled, SMU in Virginia. But we would get the new era pinstripe bowl, and, man, uh, Maryland... Just went off, man. They beat the crap out of Virginia Tech. There's no way to say it. 7-0 at the end of the first quarter. At the half was 24-10. Maryland at the end of the third. The, they just went off. They kept on beating down on Virginia Tech. 41-10 to at the end of the third. This game was over. And just to add a couple more, I don't know if these were even backups that were in. I don't know what was going on. All I know was 
the Terps ran this thing up, and you know what? Hey, some of these guys, it was their last game, so screw it. They had a good time, and they played football, and they won this thing. Man, <laughs> Ford, Ted, Virginia Tech had no answer. I think it was not. But the Terps, finishing the season at 76, talking about low and little brother, man, he's pretty good here. 20 to 24, 255 yards, two touchdowns. I don't want to further into that. Let me see here on his first name. Uh, Tulia, his name. Tulia. I'm not saying that wrong, but Tulia, or Tulia Tagovailoa. He balled, man, and once again, two, uh, 20 for, thir- for 24, 265, 265 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, we have Fleet Davis, eight carries, 57 yards, so not the, you know, they didn't run too much. But how about this, man? Jones, four receptions, 111 yards, two touchdowns. They balled, man. Maryland, Maryland balled, and that's really all I can say about this, man. Congratulations to the Terps for winning the 2021 New Era Pinstripe Bowl. So Maryland really dominated this in pretty much every facet. They had a special teams touchdown off of a off of punt return. They had a defensive touchdown. And Aulia Tungaviola really played an efficient game. And the thing for Maryland is that they did not turn the ball over once. And even though Virginia Tech's uh, turnover came in the fourth quarter when it pretty much didn't matter, Basically, Maryland just played a more cleaner, efficient game. Not too many penalties were called, and all in all, the overall offense was just pretty much on for Maryland. And believe it or not, this is Maryland's first winning season since 2014, and it's incredible to see the Terps actually rise to the occasion. And this is also, the 54 points are the most points scored in a bowl game in Maryland program history, and on the flip side for Virginia Tech, this was actually their biggest bowl game loss in school history. So Maryland really took Virginia Tech to the shed. And to shut them out in the second half was also really impressive as well. So all in all for Maryland, they really showed up and they really improved. And part of that is because they have a quarterback by the last name of Tua, Tua Tonga Viola. Or Tonga Viola. But all in all... Maryland just played an efficient game in every facet. Like, you can't get mad at that. So, big, big congrats to Maryland. And honestly, they basically just earned it. They did, man. They beat down Virginia Tech. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> that's where that one lays, man. <laughs> what a game. Congratulations to the Terps. I did not know that first winning season since 2014. But, congratulations, man. They earned that one. So, good game there. And uh, most points ever scored in a bowl game for them. That is awesome, Darren. So thanks for the great news there. Uh, man, the next game was a freaking barn burner. I, I enjoyed this. Clemson, number number 19 Clemson, will take on the Iowa State Cyclones. Now, some people probably thought, like, oh, my gosh, like this game shouldn't be that close. It's Clemson. Well, let me just tell you, Clemson hasn't been Clemson. They're kind of not Clemson right now. They're like a different team, <laughs> really. And Iowa State, man, why are y'all sleeping? Like, why are y'all sleeping on this? Like, for real. Like, why? Why would you sleep on this game? I mean, on this team. I would say it's actually pretty freaking solid. So, and they proved it, okay? So, here we go. First quarter, 3-0 Clemson. Okay, and once again, it's the Cheez-It Bowl. Uh, in the second quarter, 6-3. to Sweet, good little game here. Clemson leading it at the half. Then in the third quarter, Clemson had this explosion. Pretty solid, man. Back-to-back touchdowns for them. 20-3 to is the last of the Clemson scoring. However, defense did the rest. Only one field goal for Iowa State uh, at the end of the third. And 20-6. to the Cyclones would score with 9.42 to go in the fourth quarter, 20-13, to 13, but Clemson's defense was too much, and they would do it, man. 20-13, to 13, Dabo Sweeney got the cheese at bath. That was pretty cool seeing that on Twitter. And, yeah, man, pretty solid. A guy that we know all too well, Southern California product, coming out of St. John Bosco High School, didn't have to say a whole bunch about them this year. Last year, we certainly did. We didn't have a lot of shows last year, but in the shows that we did have, we definitely brought them up. 
and um, or a couple of years back. My apologies because I know he's uh, what a sophomore now. So all I'm saying is, is dude, these uh, this young man DJ Uyunglele, uh, twenty one for thirty two, hundred eighty seven yards, one interception. Say what you want about him, but the guy's competitor. I know he's not, you know, the second coming of Trevor Lawrence or whatever. But you got to give him credit. This team is still ranked. They still won a bowl game. They had a winning season. I get it. They're not in the college football playoff. But he's still a pretty solid player, all right? So, once again, that's just... That's just, you know, me defending our Southern California product here. Uh, but Shipley, 18 carries, 61 yards, one touchdown, and Collins, six receptions for 56 yards. Overall, man, pretty solid day for Clemson, what do you think? Yeah, it was an impressive win for Clemson, but for Iowa State, they actually had a chance to tie the, or tie the game, or they had one last drive to, like, attempt to tie the game. It was on fourth down where Brock Purdy had the ball and he ran for the first down. However, he fumbled the ball and the ball went behind the first down marker and basically Purdy recovered it, but unfortunately he recovered it behind the first down line and eventually it wasn't a first down. So Iowa turned the ball over on downs and that basically was it for Iowa State. They do deserve a lot of credit for getting for getting that close to Clemson, but they just could not pull out the victory. And that, even though that fumble was recovered by Iowa State, it just cost them dearly. So Clemson deserves a lot of credit for their season, despite it being uncertain. They start four and three and end the year on a six-game winning streak. And that win against Iowa State was actually Dabo Sweeney's 150th win in his coaching tenure at Clemson. So he has to deserve a lot of credit for that. And it's the 11th straight 10-win season for Clemson, which is the third longest streak in FBS history, which is very impressive. The fact that Clemson, like you said, they didn't make the college football playoff and they had a lot of uncertainty and they didn't win the ACC speaks to high volumes of how consistent Clemson is and how Dabo Sweeney continues to Right, the shit, despite this being the first year without Trevor Lawrence. And believe it or not, this bowl game win actually snapped a 13 game losing streak for the ACC in bowl games, which was, I did not know that was even possible. So, no. honestly, Clemson really put the ACC on its back, and I think DJ Uyunglele will improve considering this was his first starting year, and it's not easy to replace a generational talent like Trevor Lawrence. So I think now that he's got that first year under his belt, I think he'll improve going forward because he got his feet wet, and now he is going to only get better from here on out. I completely agree with you, Taryn. Let's just give the guy a chance, man. So that's pretty awesome, too. Congratulations to Dabo Sweeney, man. That's the the applause button, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great coach, great man, and he's definitely done so much for this program, and um, I'm very excited to see what you know he's gonna what he can do next there. You know, I don't think they're gonna be out for a while. I think, I think Clemson is gonna be irrelevant. I'm pretty sure they're gonna continue to rebuild, and uh, it'd be nice to see Uyunga Lele uh, get up in there, you know, and and, and get a, another major bowl win before he's out of there. Or maybe even be able to compete in the college football playoff, or maybe even for a national championship, depending on if they can get it together uh, and get you know put that team together. But or at least the way that you know it should function to win a title. So, with that said, man, last night the Valero Alamo Bowl, a much anticipated game. You have UO versus OU. You know the University of Oregon versus Oklahoma University, and Taryn. What the crap? Um, we thought it'd be a good one. At least we'd hope it would have been a good one. And it was anything but a good one, dude. I mean, you know, Oregon made it respectable at the end. But in my opinion, I don't know if they call the dogs off or whatnot, but I'm sorry. Seeing a 30-3 to halftime score... Oklahoma beat them down, man. They won this game a long time ago. I mean, yes, there are two halves, but 
And yes, all the major, well, all the touchdowns from Oregon came in the second half, three of them in the third quarter, one in the fourth. But dude, let's just be real. I don't, that fourth quarter touchdown was probably a garbage time one anyway. I mean, oh, I feel like Oklahoma long called the dogs off. Then maybe, maybe not. All I know is, dude. Before that, it was th- it was uh, forty seven to twelve to twenty five, and yeah, one more touchdown at the end of the game, forty seven to thirty two. They made it look respectable, but realistically, man. Oklahoma dominated this game. They dominated in every facet. They got down there. Look at these. Look at these. Uh, these numbers too. Williams twenty for twenty one for twenty seven. Pretty good percentage there. Two hundred forty two yards. Three touchdowns on the day. Brooks went for fourteen carries. One hundred forty two yards. Three touchdowns. And Farouk three receptions for sixty four yards. Dude, Oklahoma went off. Um, I, I get it. Both these coaches, head coaches, are heading elsewhere. But dude, one to the Pac-10, one to the ACC. But dude, I, nah, it just it it sucks because you wanted a good game here. You know, we we want a good game. I want a good game. You want a good game. We ever, we want a good football game here, and that's exactly what we didn't get. Oklahoma did their thing. O- Oregon then. Is this is this like the end of an era? Do you think, Darren? Do you think that this year's crappiness and just I mean, they won the Civil War, but Oregon State wasn't really that good either. But they fell from grace this year. We talked so much about Oregon just falling apart this year, and now that we got that in the bowl game, do you think they're going to be okay in the next season? Do they're going to take a couple years to reload? Or now that Cristobal is out of there? I mean, is it time to just completely rebuild? And who knows who we're? I don't know who we got there uh, now. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you do, but dude, is this the end of like this era for a couple of years? Is Oregon going to be like a slight bottom feeder? Are they going to be a USC for a couple of years? Like, what do you think, dude? <laughs> so I think Oregon. They obviously deserve some credit for at least making it respectable, especially in that second half. I didn't see that Oklahoma still had their starters in for the most part, just because you can't really, like, let up on the gas too much. And I was actually intrigued that Oregon got the game to as close as it, they possibly can. But unfortunately, they just made too many errors. That interception in the first quarter, thrown by Anthony Brown, really kind of set the tone of how – long of a night this was going to be for Oregon. But Oklahoma really dominated. They dominated on the ground thanks to Kennedy Brooks. And in addition to him dominating on the ground, Caleb Williams really dominated with his legs and in the air. So Oklahoma really deserves a lot of credit for that, especially Bob Stoops, who was the interim coach for the time being. So I think Oklahoma is trending in the right direction. As for Oregon... I think Oregon is going to take a little bit of time to heal, but they do have another big recruiting class coming in. So I think Oregon will be just fine. It may take them a while to, like, get back on top. Their most interesting game next year is their season opener. It's against Georgia. So I don't know how many players Georgia is losing, but I'm really going to be fascinated to see if Oregon can hold their own against an SEC team. Like, against SEC teams between Pac-12 and the SEC, the SEC team has always come out on top. So, we'll, for the most part, that is. But all in all, I think Oregon will be fine. This, if they did not get down 30-3 to at the end of the first half, I think they would have maybe had a chance. But Oregon just played a sloppy game. You cannot play a first half, and you cannot spot the other team 24 unanswered points. It just doesn't work that way. So, Oregon has a bright future, but it's going to take them a little while. There could be a changing of the guard as the top team in the Pac-12 North, but all in all, I think their future still looks bright. Yeah, man, this is, uh, well, yeah, I didn't know about their recruiting class, but silly me, I know that Oregon has definitely been a top-tier team for a while, and despite the coaching change, I'm sure they'll be just fine. So, all right, then. 
We are into today's games, and well, we got a couple games to predict, of course. We'll just go rapid fire and have some fun with this. But the next time we will be on air, good sir, will be, I believe, Monday morning. So, or oh, if I'm not mistaken, my goodness, where is it going to be at, Darren? Tuesday. Man, I, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, could be, I don't know, we could do Monday. I don't know, yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Monday morning. Yes, Monday morning we will be live. Uh, looks like 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern. Of course, we've got a big heavy day of NFL football tomorrow. I mean, sorry, on Sunday. So we could actually go live early Sunday morning, Taryn. That'd, be, that'd probably be better. That'd be really cool to do so we can recap all these games from New Year's. But regardless, this is the last show of 2021. And this is the last show before all these big fireworks happen. So let's get to it, Taryn. So, all right, man. Today we have some pretty solid games, all right? Uh, coming up in just, oh, actually just over 20 minutes, we have a pretty cool game, North Carolina and South Carolina. <laughs> kind of cool. Both these universities, different states, you know, uh, I don't know if it's too much of a rivalry, but this is kind of cool. They're opposites of each other. And Tar Heels and Game Clocks going head-to-head, both six and six seasons. However, UNC is actually favored by 12 and a half points. Interesting. Taryn, who you got and what? So something you need to know and something everyone should know is that the SEC currently is 0-4 in bowl games. Ooh. So that being said, I don't know why North Carolina is favored by that much, but I'm actually going to take them to win. I think North Carolina wins that one. I think it'll be closer. Like if someone is betting, i take the points because I don't think North Carolina will make it that close. Or, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think North Carolina will blow them out by 13 or more. I think it'll be a close game. I think it'll be a dogfight. So, I still don't trust the SEC for right now. Yeah, I did not know that's a toughie. But I do know that I would like the South Carolina Gamecocks to win. Because, well, they are the underdog in this one. And, of course, they are SEC. So, of course, you'd think that they're a more powerful conference. However... Yeah, North Carolina's actually had pretty good seasons, uh, you know, recently, and they're actually, yeah, I feel like they probably could be the better team here, so yes, I will take them as well. Once again, that game coming up at 8.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. So, next up, we got an all-Tennessee Bowl, man, and the Music City Bowl, the Trans Perfect Music City Bowl, coming up at 12 p.m. Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern. Tennessee, Rocky Top, comes in at 7 and 5. And the Boilermakers coming in at 8-4. Interestingly enough, Tennessee is favored by 7.5 points. Who you got, Darren? That is, this one's very tricky. Yeah. That is another one of those, do you take the points or do you take the other, do you take the team that's favored? I'm going to take Purdue for this one. I think Purdue <laughs> will win this one in a shootout. I think this one will be decided based on who makes fewer mistakes, who makes fewer penalties, and whose offense is more efficient. And then also, it could have to boil down to at least one or two defensive stops. So. Absolutely. I, I, I'm I not sure how Tennessee was favored in this one. I don't know why I said all Tennessee ball. I, I thought Vanderbilt. My apologies, y'all. Uh, of course, Purdue, Indiana. My apologies for sounding like an idiot. Um, but yes, Tennessee, solid game. I mean, we haven't seen them good for a while. And Purdue, in my opinion, Purdue's just had a better year. That's I just feel like, I don't know, that could be the, the SEC thing going on, you know, where it's like, yeah, this is a, you know, they're a tougher team, whatever. No, man, Purdue's played well. Purdue's won some good games this year. I'm going Boilermakers as well in this one, man. So, next up. They also beat Iowa and Michigan State, too. Yeah, so they deserve some credit here. Yeah, definitely Boilermakers in this one, so. Coming up also today, we have at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern, twelve number 12, Pittsburgh. Oh, speaking of Michigan State, <laughs> we'll be taking on at number 10, Michigan State. Pittsburgh comes in at 11-2. and two. Michigan State comes in at 10-2. and two. two solid football teams, man. And Michigan State is actually favored. Sparty is favored by three and a half points. 
This, oh man, this one's going to be a good one. Um, personally, in this one, Darren, I'm going to go as close as this game should be. I look at these losses, and I know everyone always runs to the losses, but Pittsburgh this year had some close ones. That overtime game with North Carolina was a, wow, that goes to show you that North Carolina is actually pretty good, which just further solidifies our pick, I believe, for North Carolina earlier. And they would lose to West, Western Michigan, which was kind of like, what the heck. Uh, however, beating Clemson this year was pretty solid. Losing to Miami was kind of what the heck as well. Uh, regardless, though, Pittsburgh, solid. Then you have Michigan State. Okay, you just mentioned they lost to Purdue, and they did. Purdue was a little bit better than what I think everybody thinks and gives them credit for. It. And then Michigan State also this year, not too long ago, would lose to the Ohio State, which of course would lose to Michigan, and they would get blown out. Regardless, based off of all this, I mean, they beat Penn State. They, they looked pretty good. I hate to sit here and say that losses are going to account but I kind of feel like if I have something to go off of, it's this. I'm going to go Sparty simply because I feel like Purdue is a pretty good team. Ohio State's a solid, of course, one of the best teams in the country. Pittsburgh is also very good. But there were some some losses in there that I'm like, okay, maybe you shouldn't have lost that. I don't know. And I get it at one point in the season. Who knows what was going on. But I just got to say, I feel like this is going to be a very close one. But give me Sparty, man. How about you? You made the correct call. I'm taking Michigan State as well because Pitt, unfortunately, will not have or Kenny Pickett because he is pursuing the NFL draft, and it's unfortunate. And Kenneth Walker of Michigan State will not be it will not be playing at running back as he says to skip the game for the NFL draft. But I think, to me, I think Michigan State's gonna have their way against Pitt. It's unfortunate that Pitt will not have Kenny Pickett, but I think it's for the greatest good, and they're going to need to prepare for the future. Pitt has a great foundation going on, and they have a great culture for the time being, but they're going to have to prepare their next man up. And Michigan State, I have a good feeling they will be able to get the job done tonight. But I have to acknowledge Pitt great accomplishments this year. The fact that they won the ACC for the first time in team history is impressive. And then Michigan State had an impressive season until they took those hits from Purdue and Ohio State. So all in all, I have Sparty winning this one tonight, but I got you can't take away what Pitt has done this season. Agreed. Agreed, man. Totally agreed. Uh, all right, so the SRS distrib- uh, distribution Las Vegas Bowl, final game of the night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 10.30 p.m. Sorry, 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Well, you'll be up late for this one tonight if you're on the East Coast watching this one, but man, uh, well, Central Time, too, that's 9.30, so you'll still be up pretty late if you're watching Wisconsin, uh, but man, what a game we have here. I'm actually really excited for this one, Darren. This is this this has to be a really good one. I hope it is solid. I hope we get a dog fight here. I really do. But we have here the eight and four Wisconsin Badgers versus the eight and four Sun Devils of Arizona State. I kind of feel like Wisconsin is the Arizona State of the Big Ten, and I kind of feel like Arizona State is the Wisconsin of the Pac twelve. It's kind of funny to say that, but. Both of these teams are so freaking similar. Um, not the greatest year, but at the same time, not the worst year. Solid athletes all the way around. Mertz and Daniels, two pretty solid quarterbacks that are almost identical to each other. And almost close close in yards, close in touchdowns, close in interceptions. <laughs> um, even close in their passing, you know, like completions, man, on the year. Like, the running backs, Allen and White, very similar in yards, uh, overall carries and touchdowns. And then you look at the receiving yards, uh, you, here we go again, Davis and Pershall. Or sorry, Pershall, 
close, I mean, a little bit off in receptions, but, dude, kind of pretty close in yards, close in touchdowns. I'm just saying, it's just crazy to think. And they've both played similar in their conferences this year. I'm just saying, this is a very good one. Um, Wisconsin is favored by seven points. Regardless, man, Arizona State this year has some good football games. Some some of them were so questionable. Herm Edwards has done a great job over there, but some of them were questionable. The BYU loss was a definitely not the easiest loss uh, to take because they feel like they had that game at one point, or at least were close to it. But regardless, they came out and played this year, man. They played well. And then Wisconsin, there were some some games too where you're like, what the crap, you know, like what what the heck, man? Like those some of these losses, I feel like. You know, they weren't close to Michigan but or Notre Dame, but they had Penn State in that opener. Like, I feel like that was a – I remember Cecilia and I watched that together uh, at the end of the game. We watched the end of it. And, I mean, yeah, it was a close game. But at the end of the day, man, Wisconsin seems to be the better team. Um, they should be the better team in this one. But there's something pulling on me from Arizona State, man. I feel like this team's got a fire in their belly right now. They are uh, – they're ready to roll. So this is tough. I, I actually like both schools. I think the both schools are pretty darn good. Both these programs are pretty darn good. But if I got to pick one, this is not easy. I'm going to go based off of the athletes, man. Um, I think this young man here has a pretty good uh, knack for the ball. Um, he's done well all year with less carries than the other. Um, and overall, I feel like White is a very good athlete. Just scraping the 1,000-yard mark this year, he's got 15 touchdowns. So they lean on him a lot. Uh, and, well, this quarterback, man, Daniels, he's actually done pretty well. Um, he's thrown for a lot of yards. And at the end of the day, man, as close as these two teams are, I'm going to go Arizona State by a squeaker here, man. How about you? So the thing about Arizona State this year is that they're the, they're the only FBS team whose defense has not allowed a play of 50 yards or longer this season, which is darn right impressive. However, <laughs> Arizona State will not have Darian Butler, Jack Jones, and Chase Lucas, who have opted out of this bowl game to prepare for the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. They will also not have Rashad White, who also opted out. Oh, they don't have Rashad White, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and no boy. Rashad White, as he also opted out for the NFL draft as well. So Jaden Downs is going to have to really use his leg quite a bit. And then Wisconsin, on the other hand, under Paul Chris or Christ, he is 5-1 and one with Wisconsin. And Wisconsin has the second longest Bowl game winning, bowl game uh, streak or bowl game appearance streak, which is the second longest in the Big Ten behind Michigan. Michigan's thirty-three year run from nineteen seventy-five to two thousand seven. I'm going to go with Wisconsin for this one, yeah. based on how Arizona State will be without some of its key players. I think Wisconsin will have their way. I was going to pick Arizona State, admittingly, but then I saw that with. Wisconsin was not was going to have most of its guys, while Arizona State was going to be without some key guys. So I'm going to go with the Badgers for this one. Yeah, that's all right. I'm changing up. I did not think they had that many guys out. I did not think that White was going to be out, but there you have it. I guess you should have paid more attention. Yep, give me Wisconsin as well. Darn it. I'd love to pick Arizona State in this one, but that really sucks. Uh, but regardless, hey, these young men got to do what they got to do, and that's awesome for them and their future. So... Taryn, tomorrow is a big day. Unfortunately, the Arizona Bowl is canceled, but we still have four other games, and two of those games are pretty major. So, um, kind of sucky because I feel like we're going to get through these quick, at least the first two, which is, I mean, we only got like 10 minutes before the bowl games start, before we get the Mayo Bowl. But number 17, Wake Forest, Rutgers uh, stepped in, and you know what? That's awesome. Five and seven on the year. Scarlet Knight stepped in, they're ready to play. I mean, I don't want to be a jerk, but I'm almost positive Wake Forest is going to win this thing. But you know what, man? Hats off to to, to Rutgers, man, for for jumping in here and and making this a football game to where we have a taxpayer game there. So, uh, any thoughts on this one, Darren? 
As much as I want to see Rutgers win, I got to see Wake Forest for this one, just because Wake Forest has had a pretty solid year. And now that's nothing against Rutgers. The fact that they stepped in is quite amazing. So give me Wake Forest. Yeah, all day, man. Then we have the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, Washington State comes in at 7-5. and five. The Kippewas, Central Michigan, come in at 8-4. and four. Okay. The Kippewas, solid. Solid team. They've had some good wins this year. Washington State, I kind of feel like they let a couple slip. Regardless, though, man, I really feel that there's a seven-point um, favorite for a reason. I'm not quite sure what that reason is. But I will say that they do have a quarterback who is pretty solid. Um, and though the rest of the team may not have these eye-popping numbers, this guy does. Uh, Delora is 220 for 342. Maybe not the best percentage there, but 2,070, sorry, 2,751 yards. 23 touchdowns, man. He's throwing nine picks on the year. But overall, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like they're going to do enough to get it done, man. Give me Washington State in this one. I'm actually going to take Central Michigan. I was going to pick Washington State, but then I realized Central Michigan has one really talented receiver, Khalil Pimpleton, who actually serves as the Central Michigan punt returner. And this dude is the real deal. And if he does pursue the NFL, I really hope he can make himself a name in the NFL. Just because his, he actually did have a punt return. I think he had like two punt return touchdowns for Central Michigan. And it actually turned out to be a bad beat as the in the first half as it was like 34 and a half points. And then Pimpleton scored two punt return touchdowns, which made the first half total 35, where the over-under was 34 and a half. So, I'm actually going to take Central Michigan. I think it'll be close, but I think Pimpleton will have one one big game, and if, unless, again, if he, he's only a junior, and if he does pursue the NFL, then all power to him, and I think he'll do great, but... If he does stay for one more year, I'll look forward to that. So I'll take Central Michigan. Awesome, man. Well, it should be a good game then. And then, of course, the big two. <laughs> we have here the Cotton Bowl and the Orange Bowl. Number four, Cincinnati, 13-0. First time ever getting to the college football playoff. Taking on a team that just dominates because, well, they're a dominating team program. <laughs> the 12-1, and one, number one Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama was actually favored by 13 and a half points. Uh, you know, this is very simple for me. Alabama is without a doubt one of the best programs of this last decade. And of this last decade, you could put this last decade up against pretty much anybody in history, and I think they'll be one of the better programs in the history of college football. Nick Saban has done an amazing job, and, well, it he just keeps on doing great things there. So, you have a very strong lineup here. Ryder is a great quarterback, but Bryce Young, man, we know a thing or two about him as well. He competed against Uyangalele. He competed uh, against a lot of great talent over here in Southern California from modern day. And, well, the guy has done, the young man has done amazing things. This entire team has done amazing things. I don't want to sit here and, and, and act like this is going to be a super close game. It, it, I hope it is. But I kind of feel like Alabama is going to clear that line. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like Alabama is just going to do their thing. Uh, but hats off Cincinnati on getting here. And if they happen to upset Alabama, then pff, I will, in, in, in Terrence's words here, gladly eat crow, but... Give me Alabama all day in this game, Taryn. How about you? Yeah, I'm taking Alabama as well. Bryce Young, the Heisman winner, is going to lead that team to victory 
Again, nothing against Cincinnati, but I think Alabama just has a lot of more firepower in the tank, and more importantly, Bryce Young is playing at a high level. So I'll take the Crimson Tide. Right there with you, brother. And then again, it's a little more trickier to pick. I knew I, I almost had a, I thought we were going to be the same for that one for the Cotton Bowl, but the Orange Bowl is a little different. We have number three Georgia coming at twelve and one, seven and five on the season. Oh, sorry, sorry, seven and five, twelve and one on the season. They're favored by seven and a half points. They'll be taking on the number two Michigan Wolverines coming at twelve and one. They beat Ohio State for the first time in freaking almost forever. Uh, however, they would lose one, and that one would be, well, quite the game. Michigan State sticking it to them earlier this year, 37-30, to 30, 33 in East Lansing. Georgia, they would only have their one loss, and well, this one loss coming by way of uh, <laughs> a pretty good football team, Taryn. I don't know if you you know, uh, you know know too much about these guys. I think we just talked about them. But the Alabama Crimson Tide and the SEC Championship. So, it, it and remember we talked about that game. Alabama just did their thing. So... <laughs> It sucks to say, Georgia wins this thing, we're going to get a repeat of the SEC Championship, and, well, it might be a little closer, I don't know, but Alabama's going to do it again. But at the end of the day, I know any given day, I get it. If Michigan wins this thing, will they stick it to Bama? Will it be a close game? Will they get smacked around? They haven't been to the stage before. It's the first time in the college football playoff. Darren, this is a tricky one to pick, but I'm going to go experience um, I, I, and this is, you know, a tough game for Michigan. And they've overcome a lot. But Kirby Smart's got his guys balling. This Georgia team is ready to roll. And they're pissed, man. Mm-hmm. They, they they don't like how they performed the SEC game. They want another shot at Bama, of course. Um, and, I, and I just really feel like right now Michigan Michigan's a good, solid school this year. They've, they, they've really proven that. But it's hard not to take Georgia, man. I'm, I'm going to go Georgia in this game. How about you, man? I'm going to take Michigan for this one. Oh! I think Michigan is, Michigan is going to break through. I feel, yes, Georgia has a very stout defense. But McNamara is playing a great game as of right now. He's playing solid. And then you also have to watch out for Hassan Haskins, a star running back. He could be a potential draft draft steal, and Georgia is obviously adapting well under Stetson Bennett, but do remember that J.C. Daniels did start a few games for Georgia until Bennett took over, so I'm going to go with Michigan for this one. I think Michigan wins in a close one. They are going to have to play efficient offensively, and heck, it could have to boil down to their defense, so give me the Wolverines. All right, there. I thought we might have a disagreement in this one, and I'm glad we do, man. That's good for the show. So I, I think this is going to be a good football game, man. And, and you know what? Hey, may, may the best team win. I, I feel like experience will play a role in this. But at the end of the day, it's a football game, man. It's a football game. It, it, you know, right? I mean, it's 0-0 on the clock when, when the game starts. We get four quarters, maybe overtime. And whatever these teams do within those fourth qu- four quarters and maybe over time if they happen to go there, well, that determines the game. It's it's not a hard rocket science um, deal here. It's just who plays better football. So I seriously feel like this is going to be one of those games where we're going to enjoy it. Um, I'd love to say that about Cincinnati, Alabama. I want to say that about Cincinnati, Alabama. I, we we see we both seriously doubt that'll happen, <laughs> but we do know that we're gonna get a better game, or hopefully get a better game in this second one uh, coming up. By the way, both these games here, the Cotton Bowl once again scheduled to be at twelve thirty p.m. Pacific Standard Time on New Year's Eve tomorrow, and of course 
the Orange Bowl scheduled to be at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, that is so. That is 3.30 Eastern and 7.30 Eastern here for those two games. So, with that said, Taryn, the next time we talk, brother, it'll be 2022, man, and we'll be getting you ready and set. Uh, actually, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. How could I forget all the other games here? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I guess I just felt like we we're going to end off there. My apologies, Terry. My apologies. So we can go rapid fire through these because we're actually getting ready and set for the mail bowl just getting underway. But rapid fire, Taryn, what do you think, man? The Outback Bowl on Saturday here, New Year's Eve, or I'm sorry, New Year's Day, the first game of, or the first football game, of course, of 2022. Penn State coming at 7 and 5, number 21, Arkansas. Arkansas is by two points. Who you got? I got Penn State winning because Sean Clifford will be back playing for the Nittany Lions. So give me Penn State. Good choice, man. Good choice. Um, I feel like Penn State is going to somehow come out and win this football game. But just to, just to be just to have our records be crazy, man. I'm gonna go Arkansas. <laughs> just to just to have fun here, man. But that that's that should be a good game. But I'm I'm gonna go Arkansas on this one. Next up, PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. This is another. This is one that's gonna be hard for me to pick, Taryn. I promise I'm gonna take a long. I'm not gonna take a long time. But number nine, Oklahoma State, taking on number five, Notre Dame. Oklahoma State entering at eleven and two. Notre Dame entering at eleven and one. Notre Dame favored by two points, man. This should be a good one. Who you got? I got Notre Dame winning. I think Oklahoma State, yeah. with that loss from the Big 12 championship, unfortunately kind of got their the wind knocked out of their sails. So I'm going to take Notre Dame. I think they're a little bit more efficient than the Cowboys are. I agree. I agree. I would love to take – I would love to sit here and say that – because as SC fan, you know that uh, Oklahoma State will stomp all over him. But yeah, man, Notre Dame all day. Uh, this this should be a good game here. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Notre Dame for sure. Uh, number fifteen, Iowa taking on number twenty two, Kentucky in the VRBO Citrus Bowl. Kentucky's actually favored by three points. Hmm. I'm taking. Ken- oh, sorry. Oh, you're good. You're, you're perfect. Perfect timing. Uh, Kentucky. I'm taking Kentucky to win just because Iowa. I. Don't trust them. They're not as consistent as many would thought they would be, especially when they were the number two team in the nation. So I'm going to take Kentucky to win this one. Ah, uh, you know what, Taryn? That is a good choice. Um, I was solid, and I love watching these guys ball. But there's something about this Kentucky team this year that seems special. I think they'll squeak this one out. Next up here, Taryn, we have number 11, Utah. Taking on number six, Ohio State in the Rose Bowl game presented by Capital One Venture X. This is something. This is special. Ohio State kind of fell off this year. Let's be real. They weren't their best. <clears throat> number 11, Utah, were their best. Is a souped up, feeling good, strong Utah Utes team. Ready to take on a slightly beat down but still powerful Ohio State team, or is Ohio State going to wake up and roll on this Utah team? What do you think, Darren? So Ohio State will not have the services of defensive back Garrett oh. Wilson, and then they will not have the services of one of their top wide receivers. I I'm blanking on the name here. I think it was uh, Olave, Chris Olave, and. <sighs> This is tough. I will actually – actually, Garrett Wilson is their wide receiver. My apologies. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to take Ohio State just to be safe. And you know something, Taryn? I wanted, I wanted to do that, but dang it. <laughs> So, there's something about this Utah team that I'm excited about, man. So give me Utes on this one. I'm going to say the Utes get this thing done uh, in what should be a very good Rose Bowl. And then, of course, we have the All-State Sugar Bowl coming on up to end off New Year's Day. 
Number seven, Baylor at 11 and two, taking on number eight, Old Miss at 10 and two. Don't forget, Old Miss, man, they balled this year. They won the Egg Cup. They look good, but Baylor actually looks solid, man. Uh, both these teams had a very good year. And, well, Big 12 versus SEC, Mississippi State. Sorry, Mississippi, wow, my apologies, Old Miss. Uh, looks like here, Miss uh, Old Miss is favored by one and a half points. That doesn't say very much. This is a very good game. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Actually, that says a lot, actually, as, as good as this game should be. So, Darren, final game before we're out of here, man. Who you got and why? See, I want to pick Baylor because they look very impressive in their Big 12 championship game. But i got to go with, oh, well, then again, that SEC uh, bowl game record is so tempting. Like, Matt Cole is such a great quarterback. I'm going to go Ole Miss. I think... Matt Coral gets the job done. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a hard one. I, I am stuck here. Actually, um, Old Miss looks good. They look strong. But you know what, man? I'm going to continue against the opposite to have some fun. I'm going to say Baylor squeaks this thing out, man. So there we go. So there are all of our picks for now. Taryn and I will see you coming up on uh, if everything works out for Sunday. If not, we'll talk about Monday. But we will see you in the new year as we get ready to recap all of these games. And, of course, we got the one lone game just coming up next week as we have the Tax Act Texas Bowl. Coming up, where LSU will take on uh, six and six, LSU will take on the seven and five Kansas State Wildcats, and well, there we have it. Kansas State is actually favored by three and a half points. We'll see who we pick coming up for that game. With that said, Darren, we'll recap these and get you ready for that one coming up. Like I said, either Sunday or Monday of this coming week, we'll find out. With that said, y'all, well. I think you know, as we get underway here in the mail bowl, of course, I think you know what time it is. Cue the music, because we're out of here. All right, Saren. Where can all these diehards find you, brother? You can find me on Twitter, at Saren Rodriguez1, T-E-R-A-N, then Rodriguez, then the number one. Also find me on Twitter, at set underscore point ID, and then at SoCal Show, I-E-S-R. And there will be a show on Friday. Depending on what time, though, it's still up in the air. <laughs> awesome stuff, Dan, as always. But, well, excited to hear that, and let's do this, man. We've had ourselves a great show, hour and a half we ran today. It's funny because you think we're not going to have the long show because we're just recapping and delivering, but there's just so much going on this. And, well, like I always say, you get Terry and I talking bowl games or college football together, and all this is what happens. And this is why we have this show. So with that said, y'all, you can follow me, your boy Larry, B at E-T-H-E, and it's where LB5 for y'all Twitter. Give us all a follow. Well, give us both a follow. At three and out, all spelled out, I-E-C-E for college edition, of course. Show us some love, give us a follow, and of course, follow us all as a whole at IE Sports Radio on Twitter, Instagram, and give us a like on Facebook. We certainly like that. Big shout out to our sponsors, the SoCal Warriors, and of course, Background Check International. Ken Fredman is the man. Check him out at www.bcint.com. Professional background checks only. Nothing illegal now, y'all. Professional background checks only. And the SoCal Warriors getting ready for another great season coming up. Next year, I think they're playing fall as well, but uh, well, I'll see you guys in the fall with them. So, with that said, y'all, that will be that for Mr. Tanner Rodriguez, for me, your boy Larry B. We'll see y'all next year. Until then, take care, and as always, God bless. <laughs>